J.T. Crowley is Talking Books. On this show, you'll hear from emerging talent and seasoned veterans from around the world. Hello, I'm J.T. Crowley, the host of Talking Books, and today I'm delighted to have on the show Michael Lee King, Bishop King, the author of A Sack Full of Blood, a book that chronicles the life events of two runaway children at the age of 12, Leroy Mills and Hattie Mae Caldwell. Their faithfulness and obedience to the Pentecostal mission in conjunction with the fervor of Carrie Francis Jones Jackson changed the religious and African-American culture of the all-male dominated churches and social order of the South. Michael was named after the Archangel Michael. He is the third child of two preachers, Annie Lee, his mother, and Nathan King Sr., his father. He has six children and several grandchildren and has been married to Angela, his wife, for a considerable number of years. He has a degree in music education and a Jewish doctorate degree. He presently pastors the Damascus Church on the Emmanuel Churches, as well as performing bishop duties for the churches founded by Bishop Leroy R. Mills in Florida, United States of America coupled with a teaching fellowship with Bishop Robert Lee Huey Jr. in Charlotte, North Carolina. He's written three books under the series, The Greatest Mystery Ever Revealed, The Mystery of the Will of God, and presently working on the fourth book, The Mystery of Satan. And he is feverishly bearing away at that one, everybody, to get that one complete. But it is the standalone book, A Sack Full of Blood, that we're going to concentrate in this podcast. Bishop King, you're a busy guy. Would you care to come and join me on the show? Yeah, I'm glad to be here. It's in a, a wonderful pleasure to have you on the show. And I have to say, I've looked at your book and oh my, everybody, it's hypnotic, it's absorbing, it's fascinating, it's gripping because that's how I see it. Michael, having read your book, I'm curious as to the title you gave the book, A Sack Full of Blood. Where's the correlation between the storyline and this title? Where's the title come from? Well, the the title comes from the fact that the name of my church is Damascus. Damascus, the, the name Damascus means a sack full of blood. And um, we realize that through the blood of Christ, uh, we are forgiven our sins. And so it took uh, the blood of Christ in order to uh, get these two 12-year-old runaways to eventually together to work for him. And so uh, one of the things that um, uh, when we started writing was it was the blood of Jesus. And so many things happened to these folk. You know, they were poor um, and uh, didn't have much hope except within the church. And so um, having uh, had an opportunity to come up, you know, grew up in the church all my life, being a, I'm a, from a family of preachers uh, and having watched how the transforming uh, uh, power of the Lord changes people's lives. Uh, when the opportunity uh, was presented for me to, to write the book, um, uh, first, I didn't think much of it because I was real busy. Uh, and then uh, maybe 10 years later, uh, the one of the characters uh, Geneva May, uh, at that time, she was uh, almost 90. And she mentioned to me again, um, can you, do you have time to write the story? And she began to tell me about how several other uh, people had promised her over the years to write the story. And they never came through. So uh, listening to her, I, I decided, okay, I will go ahead and do this. But then the question came up, the title. Well, um, there's a, there will be a sequel to this book called 
uh, that will bring it from 1964 to the present, which will actually uh, um, actually bring you to my church. Basically, um, what this book does is show you how it, the second book will show how I ended up um, where I am now. But I'm showing you my roots. So all of these people in this book, um, so how how I became a bishop or what I do now is because of my great aunt running away. She and of course, away. your great aunt was Hattie May. Yeah. Well, yes. Uh, she 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 ran away, and because of that, I am who I am today. And, and of course, uh, Hattie is the main person, predominantly in this book, a sack full of blood. Yes. Yeah. She she is the main she is the main character. She is. She's the main person. Yes. Yeah. Because this <laughs> main person, book, yeah. everybody is really on. Re, it's based on real people, real events. So these yes. people that are talked about in the book, they were real people. These are real lives, real events, which have happened. Yes. Michael, there are eight chapters in this, as I said, absorbing, hypnotic book of yours. I want to go to what I think is the nub, the heart of this book. And for me, apart from the Jim Crow segregation laws that were prevalent at the time, this book deals with, in an early part of it, the 20th century, the early part of the 20th century, is gender discrimination. Yes. A woman's word meant less than that of a man. Which Hattie May Caldwell, your great aunt, faced throughout the whole of her life. Yes. But yet she faced this, but she, through grit, determination, and, and along with others, they changed the mindset and the thinking of the parochial hierarchy to accepting a woman's voice, to be a woman preacher. She, she for me, when I look at the book, she was one unflinching, domineering woman that believed what she was doing was that of the Lord's asking. Yes. This, for me, is at the heart of this book, gender discrimination and your great aunt's determination to put that to bed and for women to have their say in the church. Yes. Am I right? Would you like to embellish on this? Yes. Um... Uh, one, of, one of the intriguing things that got me about the story was that um, the fact that she did not fear men. She was not afraid. Um, my mom, my mom had, my mom was like that. <laughs> my, mom, <laughs> my mom, bless her heart, um, she was a very strong-willed woman. And I'm probably more like my mom than my dad. Um, if she believed something and she wanted to get something done, she got it done. Mm. Um, and if, when it came down to the church, my mom, nothing came before the Lord, nothing came before the church, regardless. And um, when we were little, small, my mom would sit us down, thing would happen in the family or in the church. She would sit us down and she would begin to tell us um, how Aunt Hattie uh, would do things and, and the things that she would do. And so before I was able to get with the uh, adults that were still alive um, and, and writing down what happened in the book, I had heard many of the stories from my mother because she was um, eyewitness. And, but she wouldn't be telling the story uh, to just tell a story. She was trying to impart some some point or uh, get teach us some something about um, relationships, and um, and because she was so uh, important, such a central figure in our life, I have great respect for women, um, and so uh, the the story. Um, if if you read the story, it. it you said it, it goes around 
the, the difficulties that women in, in this life, in this world, uh, 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 what they go through that men don't have to go through just because they're women. Mm. And to show that even though you're going through, that if you persevere and depend on the Lord, there's nothing you can't do. And so I grew up um, believing, uh, having no problem with women preachers. My mom was a preacher. I love my mom. Um, I grew up having no problem with women leadership. Uh, and But many places I go, even today, a lot of the um, apostolic brothers, Pentecostal brothers, um, a lot of them have problems, still today, have problems with women leadership. And uh, some of them say, God, haven't sent a woman, woman to do anything. And my, my response to them then, then you were saying that the works that they did and the proof, the evidence that showed that God had to be with them, you're saying that that's not, that is not real, but it is real. This story, a sack full of blood, is real. You know, it, it the thing that she did, the thing that she endured, uh, the fact that the she was invited to do the sermon in the South, and then the preacher heard her two nights and told her not to come back. You know, yes. she put, you know, those things show that God was with her because she put the household on a fast and went about her business as if the man hadn't said anything. And God stepped in. The, pre the pastor of the church was removed uh, on emergency, went up north. And when he came back, she had baptized uh, 15 of his members uh, was that, in the name uh, of Jesus. Was that, yeah. was that Bishop Dowd? Um, no, that, that wasn't uh, Bishop Dowd. That was a, um, Bishop Dowd was a, was a young man that when she moved to um, yes. uh, Philadelphia. When she moved up to Philadelphia, yes. Philadelphia, yes, yes. she yeah. got him saved. Yeah, yeah. She, she worked with him. And he became one of her bishops. You know, it's amazing. Um, she could uh, get them out of the street, clean them up, uh, get them in the church, uh, help to get them saved, and they become her, her bishop. <laughs> it's just I mean, amazing. I, what struck me, uh, Bishop Mike, was when we, when, when we look at the life of Hattie, your great aunt, let's take her uh, life and let's, let's piece this together, everybody. She was born in 1903. She ran away at the age of 12. So she would have had very limited education, you know, when she went yes. to the, um, the school that she went to. Um, she, she had 10 children with a, a guy called James Lucky. And they were living in a common law cohabitation relationship, meaning they weren't married. Right. She wanted to be married, but he didn't. Uh -huh. um, as I said, yes, she had a very limited education. She had a tough childhood, if any childhood at all. And, you know, you think about it. No wonder she wanted to move north for a better life. She would have had, um, she would have been stigmatized for the, having children out of wedlock. She had a very tough life, but yet she rose through it all. She, a dominant character. So as the story, the book is based on real people, the true situations, how do you think she, Hattie, did what she did? You know, tell us more here. Tell the listeners more here. Um... The back back when she came through, um, all African Americans in the South were, were having it rough, mm. um, and it was a common thing for older men to steal uh, away young girls. Um, Sometimes it would be um, black men, white men. It didn't make any difference. Children would. It was a common thing for children to come up missing. And um, it, it was just, and because most of the people, the African-Americans, live what we call close to the earth. I mean, they were dirt farmers, sharecroppers, 
because those were only with limited education, that was the only jobs they uh they, they could fulfill. And as a consequence, they depended on the Lord a lot because they went to church. When the church was open, they were there. Because um not knowing, not having a lot of education, not being able to uh decide, well. Since I have this education, I'm going to go do this. You didn't have that choice. So you depended on the Lord. If you needed a crop, you need to get a crop in, it wasn't raining, you went to church and you 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 prayed for rain. Um, if there was a sickness, uh, you didn't have the money to go to the to, to the hospital or a doctor, uh, you prayed. You know, you, you called on the elders, you prayed. So the families were uh, knitly tied together around the church. Well, by her uh, being stolen, she was actually stolen from home. Uh, we call a runaway. She wanted to go, but a 12-year-old uh, cannot have the proper uh, consent, can give consent to run away. Uh, so, but she ended up having these children and even, well, after I was grown and she was gone, I would hear other people in the family mentioned her name in a whisper from time to time. And it would be, uh, after I started writing the book, I found out why they were whispering. The fact that she had all these kids, she had 10 kids out of wedlock, two kids um, after she married the second, after she married her first husband. So she had a total of 12 kids. But um, people talked about her. And even um, just several years ago, she been, she passed away in 64. Several years ago, I overheard a conversation. Uh, someone was talking about the fact that she walked off and left her children. You know, not knowing, uh, not knowing the, if, uh, the, the circumstances, but you know, they were just discussing it because the family, the Caldwell family in the area where we grew up is well known. It's a huge family. And they are known as being church-going people. So she had it real hard. She had it very difficult from all, from family, friends. It was real hard. And for her to turn to the Lord and then come and say, I'm saved. And then turn around and walk off and leave your children. That was extremely hard. She that was back to them. She took one, didn't she? She took the youngest. She took she the came back. She came yes. back to them. Yes. She came yes. back on a regular basis to them every weekend. So she didn't yes. really abandon them. Yes. She was there for them. And she remained there for them throughout the whole of their lives. Yes. Let's get that cleared up. Yes. See, I have read the book. <laughs> <laughs> you have. <laughs> I have read the book. Yeah. And we see in the early chapters, um, Bishop Michael, Hattie's determination to make sure her daughter. Now, Genevieve was child number seven, everybody. Yes. And I believe, um, you know, she came up with one heck of a plan to make sure that Genevieve May didn't go down the same road, the same path, the same route of life that she did. Yes. You know, sending her up north to her older sister um, to avoid Willie Lee and the boy, you know, she fantasized over. Um, in fact, Jennifer May was the only child out of all of her children who maintained a deep Pentecostal belief. The others fell by the wayside. So my question to you is, it must have been hard for Hattie to do what she did to Genevieve. And I have to say to the other children, deviate from what she fought so hard for. That was hard for her. Would you like to comment here? Because you, she's your great aunt, and yes, it was your, through your mother that you learned all about Hattie. Yes. That would have been hard well, for a woman, wouldn't it, to do that? Well, um, she... Aunt Hattie... It, although I don't remember meeting her, but my mom presented her to us in such a way to it's almost like i know her character uh she was such that when she changed and found 
what was right if you were in her care whether you wanted to do right or not she's going to see to it that you held the standard that was just and that was the way my mom was you know um my mom was uh you didn't have to get saved if you didn't want to but you were going to church mm -hmm. um you didn't have to get saved if you didn't want to but when you out in public you were going people were going to think you were saved because you weren't going to curse you, you weren't going to uh fight and do all kinds of crazy things you weren't going to steal you weren't going to cheat and, and bully people um mm -hmm. we grew up in a regimen like that and that was the the story that my mom would give us that was the way aunt hattie was you know and so geneva may was there by this time geneva may aunt hattie was actually raising geneva may yeah. um you know in the early years she had to leave them but by this time uh some of her kids she actually had her, some of her kids and she knew what was happening and she knew how she had been and she knew if uh she did it at age 12 and this young lady get ready to turn 16 she knew it was in her to do and she did not want her to suffer um the uh being ostracized in the public and you walk by and people whispering at you and you know that was her, that was her concern and geneva may um uh this part of the story geneva may uh she told me this part of the story and i recorded it and just tell me how her, her mom was and her mom was very was very stern um she believed in the lord she she what she preached she she lived and mm. um she knew when she was uh basically exiled to philadelphia um geneva may knew that there was no going back no she I'm knew if I thought it was fascinating when I was looking in the book, you know, um, she put Geneva May on the bus, you know, she bought the ticket to send her up to her older sister. And yet she had to go and sit at the back of the bus, didn't she? Yes, yes, yes. yes. She had to go and sit, in, yes. And her mother, um, talk, you know, she had to talk with her, just like African-Americans have to talk with their kids today. You know, um, you, you, the constitution says you have a right, but I want you to come back home. Yeah. You know, so yes, you have a right to do this, but I want you to come back home. And even in, in even in the Bible, uh, the Apostle Paul talks about um uh I have the right to do these things. Uh I, yes, I have a right, but everything is not expedient, you know, uh, and I'm not going to come under the power of any of it. If you come under the power of your rights. You might lose your life mm. and so she taught her children as way my mom taught us you have the right yes but i want you to come home yeah so um she went to the back of the bus because that's what that was the law of the land at the time that was the law of the land at the time yeah yeah, yeah. jim crow laws law segregation yeah, yeah. Bishop Michael, can we move to into a little bit more into the book, you know, chapters four and five, you no know, church in Philadelphia, um, <laughs> save my people back to the south. Hattie moved up north and she was, she'd met a, a new man in her life, uh, Earl Greer. This is a new chapter for Hattie. This is a turnaround. For, for me, I think this was the turnaround in her life here. She started to build church communities she started to build churches she started to um, get black african americans to see to convert across from the traditional um baptist or methodist um practices to you know pentecostal ways you know and with the different style of course this is all based on the different style of baptism i baptize you in the name of jesus yes. and the holy spirit Whereas in the Baptists or certainly in the Catholic Church and that I baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Yes. With the Pentecostal movement, it's done differently. I baptize you in the name of Jesus. Yes. 
and it's not a christening. And the difference between a christening and a baptism, everybody, is christening is what the Catholics do. It's a service on the altar at the font. Baptism is full immersion in a river. And that's what was so important to Hattie and all the others. It was the full immersion, just like our Lord was fully immersed in the River Jordan. And he said, I baptize you in the name of Jesus. Yes. I'm right, aren't I? You're right. (laughs) You're right. And that was part of the, um, the fight, so to speak. I mean, yeah, this yeah. was this was a very significant part of her work, wasn't it? And it's very significant yes. to you as well in your work as a bishop in the church. Yes, yes, that is one of the major things we run we we run into um, because uh, we teach that, and we show by scripture that no one. Um, no one pronounced uh, the titles Father, Son, and Holy Ghost over anybody in the, in the Bible when they were baptized. They used the name of Jesus. Hmm. And this is how we take on his name. We take on his name by the name being pronounced over us when we are buried, uh, submerged in the water, buried with him. Like when you're buried, dirt is over you, all right? If, if the body's laying on top of the ground, and you sprinkle some dirt, you don't consider the body buried. You consider the body buried when you cannot see the body. And so we take that word and we look at what the apostles did and we do what they did. That's why why we call ourselves apostolic because we follow the the teachers, teachings of the apostle and their ways. Mm. Uh, We figure, no one else knows better than they did. They were there, you know. Yeah. Here, here come a giant come lately, uh, yeah. centuries later, and say, "I got a new idea. I think this is how he did it." Now Geneva May, she wasn't bit, she wasn't keen on getting the dunking, was she? <laughs> uh, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> and the uh, the sister uh, Dora, um, the one we call Dora, El Dora, her older sister that. Uh, she was adamantly not trying to be baptized. Mm. You know, uh, the water in my face, the chapter talks about water in my view. You know, uh, Eldora, uh, at seven years old, she was adamant about not being baptized. But her mother uh, is like, you my child. <laughs> You're going to be baptized. Yeah. You know. Get on. Um, <laughs> but uh, <laughs> she eventually got over it. She was much older, though. Do you know what I find fascinating also in the book, uh, Bishop Michael, is the Jewish link. Yes. I thought that was just extraordinary. How, you know, Hattie had a close Jewish friends. And when you look at Judaism, and when you look at the apostolic way of the Pentecostal movement, the church there, they're very different. But yet... Hattie turned, she had Jewish friends. How did that come about? Well, um, we find that, uh, like in Philadelphia, uh, we find like in in Philadelphia that um, many of, at least in the areas in in Philly, West Philly, uh, place called Germantown, that area, there are a lot of Jews in that area. And that's where Aunt Hattie and they live. And uh, many of the Jews own the businesses and the shops. So if you wanted a job, more than likely you were going to um, um, meet a Jew. And they, they were friendly, you know, um, because of the fact that uh, we are Pentecostal. And we recognize the fact that when we come on the Lord's side, we become spiritual Jews. Um, that's what the New Testament ah, teaches. Yeah. That's what the New Testament teaches. And so the connection is, uh, Paul talks about that a Jew is not that which is outward, but that which is inward. Correct. And so 
um, that becomes part of our life. That becomes part, part of our life. Christ Jesus, um, the flesh of him was born of a Jewish girl. But right. Jesus, is, Jesus is God Almighty. He has no gender. He has no race. No. All right. So, but in order, if, if you got to pick one, okay, then okay, then this is what you got because it is his name that we are baptized in. We become the bride of a Jew. I mean, if, if, if you pull him back in the flesh, yeah, all right, then we become his bride. We become a Jewish bride because he is the husband man. So that was the Jewish connection in the book. I just thought it was wonderful. Absolutely yes. wonderful. Absolutely. Um, it's very easy, you know, Bishop King, to talk so much about your book about Hattie, Mother Greer. You changed the name from Hattie to later on in the chapters to Mother Greer, being her surname when she got married to Eric Greer. You know, it's very easy to see her as the main protagonist in your book, but I think it's only fair that we should briefly mention the other people within the book because they are just as important to this great story. You know, I'm talking about Hattie McAfee, Leroy Mills, the other runaway child. Yes. The community of the Woodleaf Congregation at the Hart Road School for Negroes. Yes. Edna Caldwell Cowan. Yes. Your mother, Annie Lee King. Your father, Nathan King Sr. Ray Ferrans, C.F. Jones Jackson, the chief overseer. And others. Yes. Uh, how important were all of these people to the church, to you, to the book, and to how you lead your life at the moment? Well, first, my mom and my dad, um, all that I knew about the world, I learned from my, my mom and my dad. I didn't know anything about uh, Baptist, Methodist. I didn't know anything about racism, um, people being used in discrimination against folk, uh, except what I was taught. For instance, um, in the 60s, my dad would go to the, the restaurant to buy us food. And he'd always go in the back door mm. of the restaurant where they cooked. Mm. And I thought it was fascinating that my dad could go in there where they were cooking and point to the food and tell the man, I want that piece. I want that piece. He'd be standing over the food and didn't have to go around the front. I did not know that my dad... It was illegal for my dad to go in the front door. It was. Yeah, I did not know that. Here it is in the 60s. I'm growing up, and I did not know. I did not fully understand that until um, late high school, until I got to college. I did not understand. I did not know the difference between the NCAA and the NAACP. I grew up in the church. and. My mom and dad did not teach racism. They, my mom always told me, there's, no, uh, there's nobody greater than you. You are no greater than anybody else, but there is no one greater than you. Mm -hmm. And uh, God made us all, and you, you should not mistreat anybody. And so this is because of the Pentecostal message. Yeah. In Christ Jesus, there's neither male nor female, Jew, no Greek, bond for free. We all the same. We all one. And so by my Aunt Hattie running away, but before her, Leroy Mills ran away at age 12. His mother was Pentecostal, was speaking tongues from time to time. He thought his mom was losing her mind. So he ran away at age 12, trying to get away from his mama and ended up working with the railroad and ended up in Florida. And the as the story goes, um, he was going to rob a bank. He was on his way to rob a bank um, yes. and had a liquor bottle in his pocket. And back then, uh, the churches, the holiness churches, or wherever you could find a building, in the middle of a field, 
middle of a field, there was a little white building painted white, and these uh, Holy Ghost field folk was out there having church. And he met them. Of course, that meeting changed his life. And because of that, he ended up coming back because Leroy Mills is a distant cousin of mine. So he's family too. He came back to get his people saved. And when he came back, most of our people were Baptist, Presbyterian, and Methodist. Mm. And so they were, they were dedicated church-going folk. And people thought he would lose his mind. They literally thought, you know, man, you don't lost your mind. What this stuff you talking about? But because he was family, they would give him an audience. And that's what he made. I, I guess that's where they that's why they were blessed, or somebody might say that's where they made a mistake, but it wasn't a mistake. Uh they would give him the audience and people would let him in his church. He would be what's called a brush arbor. Uh in Africa, he took the idea from Africa where um you be out in the field, you all the sun, you take poles and you put them together and you put a mm -hmm. brush, you take cut limbs off of trees and you put brush to make a shade. And so when the people would take a break from working in the fields, they would come over and he would sit there and, and preach to them right out in the field. And as a consequence, they began to hear him. And some began to believe what he was saying. And my Aunt Hattie had 10 kids. One of them was an arm baby. She went to one of those meetings. Wow. And that's how he got her. And of course, um, uh, the uh, uh, overseer Seal Jackson, she was a woman. The re way she got it, got it, got into the story. When uh, Aunt Hattie was an evangelist to, at, at heart, her 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 uh, thing was she would go out and she would uh, start uh, Bible studies and prayer meetings in people's homes, and people start coming. People get baptized, people get saved, but it wasn't her thing to sit still and pastor that congregation. She would always find someone else to come in and take it over. She'd move and plant another church. Well, that's what Hattie did, didn't she? She would start off her preachings in somebody's house. Yes. She would ask for money off the local bishops so she could build a church. It may be a very simple church, but that's what she did. And then it, you know, the community thrived from there and still does today. And yes. that's why I think all the characters in your book are so important, not just Hattie, because yes. you need them all. Because without them all, it doesn't work. Right. That's it. Right. Um, did you enjoy writing the book? And what's next for Michael Lee King, the author? Um, yes, I enjoyed... Um, it was almost addictive, because what I actually did a lot of the people that's in the book, some of them are gone now, but when I started writing, they were still here. Um, and I was able to go and sit. They were in their 80s and 90s. Mine's crystal clear. I would go and sit with them and put the tape recorder down, and they would just talk. And when they get when they get to an interesting part, I would ask a question, and then they would elaborate and give me detail. There are a lot of things that they told me is not in the book. Um, <laughs> you know, some things I left out because I didn't think it was going to add to the point I was trying to make. And so I did not include in the book. But there's a lot of things that um, is not in there. <clears throat> and as a consequence, I really enjoyed, I enjoyed um, getting the eyewitness testimony that corroborated the things my mom told us when I was a little boy. As Geneva May and um, Aunt Dora, well, she's actually our cousin, but saying, saying Cousin Dora didn't sound right. So I would call her Aunt Dora. Uh, but she was 92 years old. Mine, crystal clear. And she would sit there and tell me the stories. And, and I take them. And I just basically took what the, um, the testimonies and put them in chronological order. Basically, and, um, and of course, our goal now is to, uh, I hope is to take the book from 1964, because a, a lot of people have come and said to me, 
that are still alive. There are some now that are still alive in the 80s. Why did you stop the book at um, uh, there? Why, why didn't you? There was a lot of things. Why didn't you? Why didn't you bring them forward? I said because that was what my goal was to get the story out concerning the work of of the ones that that started that got it started. Now I can bring it forward. So uh, the goal now is to go from 1964. I was four years old. Um, as a little boy, I used to go out in the woods. I grew up in the country uh, by uh, a creek. And I would talk to the Lord. I remember just like it was yesterday. Um, I was small for my size. And I would say to the Lord, um, if you, uh, why did you make me so small? Um, if you had made me the size of my mom and my dad, I could do stuff for you. Uh, there's so many other things I would promise him. I was a small child, and I would just by myself. My mom would say, "Son, when you go out, take somebody out there with you." You know, you're talking uh, to uh, people. She yeah. was afraid, you know, something going to happen. But they, when I was growing up, they would call me a loner because how can you talk to the Lord? I like to talk out. I like to speak with my mouth, not in my head. I like to speak out loud, and I will speak out loud to him and ask him. Why did you make me so little? I didn't know that I, as a child, I was going to grow. To me, I never grew. It was like I was always the same size. I was always little. <laughs> and so... Well, there's another book to come, and it's about him, everybody. <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, Bishop King, where can people get your book? Your books, you know, you know, a sack full of blood, plus your other books. Where can they get them from? Uh, they can get them from um, Amazon, Books A Million, um, uh, any bookstore uh, that, uh, major bookstore, book chain, or a bookstore that can order books. You can put my name in, I pull up, you, but Amazon, you go on my website um, and, and basically click, and it'll take you direct to the books. And on Amazon, you can even read. You can go in, they'll let you read large portions of the book, even if you don't buy it. Who do you see as your market for this book? And who would you like the market to be? I would like the market to be um, because I'm a teacher at heart. For one, the men that don't believe that a woman's word should be uh, or is as important as the word from a man. Um, first, because in my books, I'm in defense, uh, book one, book two, and book three, my other books, there's a chapter on gender discrimination. And, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm in defense of a woman. I'm in defense of women being able to do for the Lord. Uh, and so I, uh, the market would first, and then of course, <clears throat> the next group would be women themselves. So when they get these men that says, um, hey, you know, you, so, um, uh, you shouldn't be doing this or blank, blank, blank. I'm giving them the ammunition. Because these women, when you read the book, you realize there were men that these women had helped to get to where they were. And here they were still working. And the men knew they were real. But still yet, they were reluctant or slow, let me say. Uh, or negligent in coming to their aid, like Bishop Dobbs, you mm. know, uh, um, he was slow to come. And so as a consequence, uh, Aunt Hattie went and talked to uh, Osis Jackson, and she was eager. She was another woman that they fellowship with. She was eager to go. And as a consequence, she was a businesswoman. Mm. They, uh, Interstate 85 wasn't built then. They had to ride 29 and 70. And they came all the way to North Carolina from Philadelphia. And um, they found they had found a, a, uh, the Old Heart Negro School, a uh, school for Negroes. And um, she just took the money and, and bought the building for them. So that's how the women, and I think it was intentional by God. Uh, because I think some you, you might 
criticize the men for not coming, but I think, I don't think the journey would have been as magnificent as it was, although they were suffering, as magnificent and as a beautiful story had the men came and jumped on board. Because what would have happened? They would have came, jumped on board, and had it would have backed completely out, and we wouldn't be talking about women. See. Thank you very much, Michael Lee King, Bishop King, for coming on my show today to share a glimpse into what your book, A Sack Full of Blood, is all about. I thoroughly enjoyed it. Um, and I hope everybody, you know, you've gained a little insight into Michael Lee King's book, his background, a bit about himself. Enough of a tantalizing insight to make you want to go to his webpage at www.michaelleeking.com to find out more about him and where you can get his books. Um, I hope you will click on the books, view, and if I dare say, buy them. But his books are a great read, everybody, and for me, a must buy. Alternatively, you can click on the book cover image at the bottom of the written introduction that I've done, and that will take you straight to Amazon. Once again, thank you, Michael Lee King, Bishop King, for coming on my show. I'm JT Crowley. Thanks for listening, watching, wherever you are in the world. So until next time, stay safe.